Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Cleveland Quartet in a box on RCA. Now, there are two, two clumps of Cleveland Quartet output. There's the RCA stuff, and there's the Telarc stuff, some of which duplicates the RCA stuff. And Telarc, of course, really should put out a Cleveland Quartet box, but fat chance of that happening anytime soon. So I'm very happy we have this. Uh, they have, let's see, it's 23 CDs. And I have to say, this was a very, very interesting experience for me, going through these recordings again, because there were a bunch I didn't know. And, and it was a great joy listening to them. And they sound very different to my ears today as they would have sounded when they first came out. And I'll tell you why. First of all, there is a big difference from listening to, indi in listening to individual recordings over a span of years. And these came out over like, what, I don't know, 20 years or something? Was it 19? No, it's 1972 to 1987, so 15 years. Um, and most of it was repertoire that other people had did, done and other quartets, often supremely well. And so you, you compare the individual performance to all the other individual performances of the same work. And quite often, you already had half a dozen or more, and this was good, but it wasn't like the best, so you didn't get too excited. But when you hear everything together in a box, you can appreciate, first of all, um, the unique qualities of the ensemble in a concentrated sort of way that you may not have appreciated so much before, at least in direct comparison with other recordings. And also, um, you see the whole recording program. And that was very, very interesting for reasons I will go into in a moment. So, so this was really a lovely, a lovely opportunity. Here they are when they were young. Um, one of the players, the violist, that's this lady here, was later replaced, but without any, you know, noticeable difference in ensemble quality or anything like that. I mean, they were supremely gifted players. They all trained like a Juilliard, and, you know, they were, but they didn't sound like the Juilliard Quartet. They didn't sound like, um, you know, a lot of the other string quartets around during the day. They had, listening to this, it seems to me, a rather characterful sound, a uniquely sweet sound. It's so different from what we hear today, especially from period instrument groups where beauty of tone and, and the idea to charm us with, with timbre is totally, utterly, you know, it's like Hindemith's direction in one of his string pieces where he says beauty of tone is beside the point. He just wanted to play it as fast and rowdy and raw as possible. Well, that's the way a lot of ensembles operate today under the guise of authenticity. So hearing this was like, it's like balm to the soul to hear an ensemble that really cares about making a beautiful, sweet sound. Now you might argue that in some of this repertoire, you, you want a little more edge. And that's fair. That's perfectly fair. But uh, you can't argue that they had a sound. It was theirs and it was lovely and they maintained it and, and it's on display here. Now here's the other interesting thing about this box that I find really, really desirable, and which makes it, for me, um, a, a definite acquisition. Yes, you get sort of some standard quartet stuff in here. You have their Beethoven cycle, which is very good, by the way, and other things. But, but more importantly than that, they were RCA's sort of second-tier quartet, not in quality of playing. It was purely a marketing issue, because RCA had the Guarnieri Quartet, and and Sony had the Juilliards, and everyone had their string ensembles, of course. And, you know, the, the European labels, you know, Philips had the Quartetto Italiano, and Deutsche Grammophon had, had Melos and Amadeus, and, you know, they, they had their groups. And because it's chamber music, which is written for a tiny subset of the universe of classical music anyway, uh, it, it's not something that you can really afford to have tons and tons of duplication of repertoire. So what this quartet did quite a bit of was was chamber music making with colleagues. That is not just purely the string quartet repertoire. I think there's probably more here of this or as much as not pure string quartet repertoire in here um, than there is string quartet repertoire. And that's what makes this valuable to me, makes it wonderful because there's all kinds of stuff, particularly music with piano with Emmanuel Axe, who was a fabulous chamber music performer, you know, that, that really has, has made this a pleasure, 
a pleasure to dip into. So let's go through this. And I mean, and that was happenstance. It was economics. It really was. I mean, you know, the Cleveland Quartet stuff, it's all going to be in the Emanuel Axe box, too, or, you know, these other performers. So some of it is is not unique to this box, let's just say. But it's it's really, really interesting to see the, how the the circumstances, the economic circumstances of the music business at the time that they were making these recordings it created a legacy that's really quite distinct from that of of most of your other string quartet boxes. And in terms of repertoire, I think a heck of a lot more interesting because it's not the same old, same old. Not entirely, anyway. So let's let's go through this and, uh, and I'll, we'll, we'll tell you what's in here and what makes it so much fun. So it begins with the Brahms string quartets. And I will say this, this was their inaugural project for RCA. Um, they are marvelous in the Brahms quartets. I mean, the Brahms quartets for me are problematic works because they're very thickly written, very dense, um, and in a couple of places kind of dour and very serious and, you know, overthought in my view. But but these are wonderful performances. They're, they are incredibly transparent and and linear but with this gorgeous overall sonority. I mean, they're, they're just beautiful performances. They remade some of these for Telarc. They remade a lot of this stuff for Telarc. I don't want to keep going back to that. But this is a wonderful debut in very difficult repertoire and repertoire that was somewhat unusual because the Brahms quartets are not the major Brahms chamber music. So let me start out on the most positive note and saying everything they did by Brahms is marvelous. They really had a feeling for Brahms. They made it their own. Um, and uh, in a way that very few other string quartets really did. And they had the opportunity to make it their own because they do more than the string quartets. There are only three of them, after all. They do a lot of the other chamber music. And that is really cool. So next, we've got Schubert's, uh, let's see, wait a minute, Brahms, that's one and two. Those are the first two discs. Schubert's Death and the Maiden and the Mozart Adagio and Fugue in C minor. It's a very good, solid Death and the Maiden quartet, but there were lots of them at the time. No one hearing this is going to be upset. Um, and you're not going to be overwhelmed because there are fabulous Schubert quartet cycles by groups that really, really hit the Schubert quartets. So that's nice. Then we've got the Schubert octet. Well, that's nice to have. The Schubert octet is this huge, hour-long, you know, serenade-like monster piece um, that there just aren't that many recordings of. I mean, it was always kind of a, a rarity for some reason because it's big and it's long. It's really long. It's got one, two, it's uh, six movements and, and themes and variations. And they're quite Schubertian. That means they go on to heavenly length. Um, and we've got, let's see, who's in this? Jack Brimmer, clarinet, Martin Gott, bassoon, Barry Tuckwell, horn, and Thomas Martin, double bass. And it's beautiful. It's produced by Chuck Gerhardt. Yes, Charles Gerhardt, he of movie music fame, which is just delightful. Then we've got a couple Haydn quartets, very nicely played, bracing and attractive. Every quartet had to do some Haydn, right? Oh, look, wait, hold it. We have a visitor. There's Mildred. Hey, honey, you want to say hi to everybody? Yeah, would you like to? No, probably not. Anyway, Mildred is hanging out. She likes to hang out here when we do these videos. And I guess I'm exciting her tremendously because she passes out immediately. So the Haydn Quartet, it's the Lark and the Fifths, the uh, D minor quartet, two great quartets, one from Opus 63. Um, no, it's, no, it wasn't. It's Opus 64, right? Yeah, I think. And Opus 76. But I don't know, 60 some odd. I, I never remember what the Opus numbers are. Then we've got CD6, the Barber String Quartet, which is wonderful because it has the Adagio in the middle. You know, the Barber Adagio, which is originally part of his string quartet, and the Charles Ives Second String Quartet, which is insane and absolutely splendid. And let's see, with the fabulous Arguments Second Movement, it's an argument featuring an Allegro Conspirito versus Andante Emasculata, which is hilarious. And then we've got, let's see, the, the Ives Scherzo for String Quartet, which is just a minute long. I wish they'd done more American music. I wish they'd done more contemporary music. Of course. Of course I do. But they didn't. And that's nice to have. Then we've got the Brahms Clarinet Quintet with Richard Stoltzman. They're marvelous. I think Stoltzman's terrific. But of course, Stoltzman is, is something of a controversial character in clarinet universe because he had a very distinctive timbre. 
distinctive vibrato, and some people liked it, and some people hated it, all of which meant he had personality and good for him. It's lovely. Then we've got the Dvorak Quintet with Emmanuel X, the piano, uh, the, the piano quintet number two, which begins with the most beautiful tune in the history of humanity, um, and it's a gorgeous performance. Absolutely beautiful. Then we've got the Mendelssohn Octet, when they're joined up by the Tokyo String Quartet, which is really very cool. It's a fantastic version of that. And some of Mendelssohn's four pieces for string quartet, the theme and variations and the scherzo. Um, those were never, those are just random pieces that he wrote for string quartet that were published posthumously. But the Mendelssohn Octet, masterpiece, screaming, shrieking, masterpiece. And it's a wonderful performance by two great string ensembles. Then we've got the Beethoven quartets get started. I will say this, and it's, it's characteristic of their music making in generally, uh, gen pardon me, generally. Uh, the, the, there's an interview at the beginning of this thing, let me just say, um, with how they got together and what they were doing. And it talks about their first recording of their Brahms, where the model was the, the uh, Budapest Quartet. And I think that you hear something of this in their timbre, not the Buda Budapest Quartet, but this, this warmth of sound, the willingness to be a little bit emotionally sentimental. It was terribly out of style um, back in the 70s and 80s when they were doing these things. It's even more out of style now, all of which makes it sound terribly, wonderfully personal and characterful now. That's part of what I meant. Even the opening, they, they, they begin with the middle quartets, of course, because those are the most popular ones. That was the first album released. Razumovsky number one. It's just, it's, you hear, there's no sense of, 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 what, what's the, you know, haste. That's the word, haste. You know, it's da 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 da, ya da 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 da. You know, that, that singing quality is always there. It's beautiful. It characterizes the whole Beethoven cycle. I remember when it came out and, you know, reading reviews back in the day, and some people felt that it was too sweet, a little bit too soft-edged in places. I think it's lovely. I really do. It has a, a certain poise. You know, I would almost call it European-sounding, a little old world here and there, um, which is, is, is very, very characterful. So then we've got, let's see, okay, so we've got the Beethoven stuff. Um, Beethoven's early quartets, Beethoven's late yeah, middle quartets, the late ones come in a minute. Uh, Brahms sextets run CD 16. I have to confess, when this first came out, which was in 1977 and 78, uh, you know, I was, I was all of 16 and 17 then. Yeah, I think so. 77. Yeah, I would have been 16 thereabouts, 15, 16. And I really didn't care about chamber music. I didn't even know what it was. And then later I knew this existed, but I wasn't interested. And so I didn't listen to it. And I just did. And it's fabulous. <laughs> I love it. I just love it. It's gorgeous. Oh, my God. They're so in tune. Their intonation is phenomenal, especially the first movement of the G major quartet with all that stuff in octaves. It's just, oh, my God. It's miraculously well-tuned. You've got Pinka Zuckerman and Bernard Greenhouse. A fantastic additional players joining them in the sextets. I, I adored this record. I really did. It was just a wonderful discovery for me. Then we've got the late Beethoven quartets, uh, da, 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 including the Grossa Fuga, of course, um, not as the regular finale. You can switch, you, to, you know, decide which finale you want. Um, the Schubert Quintet, which was on Sony with Yo-Yo Ma. Oh, it sold millions because it had Yo-Yo Ma. Remember that? Just billions and billions and billions of copies. It's a beautiful performance of the quintet. So I have no complaints there. Then we've got the Brahms Quintet for piano, two violins, viola, and cello. The, it's the F minor piano quintet. That's the thing with Emmanuel Axe. A beautiful performance of that as well. I keep saying beautiful, but that's what really strikes me about. It's beautiful and passionate and expressive and a little bit... A little, it's romantic playing. It's so nice and romantic music. That's why we call it that. You know, you feel the emotion coming out. It's, it's just lovely. And then we've got the uh, Schumann Quartet and Quintet, Piano Quartet and Piano Quintet, also with Emmanuel Axe. I think these were always rather well-regarded performances. Oh, and that's it. Oh my goodness, I'm just getting warmed up here. I wish there were more. I wish there had been more, I really do. But you see where I'm going here? You've got these 
wonderful performances. You've got quintets, you've got sextets, you've got works for piano and strings. It's just lovely. And then you've got, of course, the usual string quartet stuff. I'm sure that they probably wish they could have done more of the usual string quartet stuff. They did do that for Telarc. You can get, for example, them doing Smetna and Borden and Debussy and Ravel and, you know, all of all of that normal string quartet stuff that other quartets do. And they did them and they did them very beautifully. But this, they're young, they're fresh, they're adventurous. They've got great, great partners in all of their chamber music explorations. And I just think for that reason, this is a marvelous, marvelous, marvelous set. They should have called it Cleveland Quartet and Friends. But for the Brahms alone, this is worth hearing. There's some sensational Brahms on here. There really is. So there you go. Keep on listening, friends. I hope you hear this and enjoy it. I really do. It's 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 not just for people who like string quartets. It really gives you a nice chunk of great chamber music. And that's wonderful. It should be marketed that way, I think. But who, what do I know? Hi, keep on listening. Did I say that? I don't remember. Take care.